Good evening, Team SCCA. I'm Mike Cobb, President and CEO of the Sports Car Club of America, and I want to welcome each of you to our 2023 Hall of Fame Award Show. We're very excited to be with you tonight, and we're honored to bring you this celebration featuring your Sports Car Club of America 2023 Hall of Fame inductees, along with Member of Excellence and Wolf Bernardo Award winners. Tonight, we will recognize and celebrate nine of our finest, members who've made incredible contributions to this club, the broader world of motorsports, and who have a combined 200 plus years of overall SCCA membership. So round up your friends and family, get the popcorn and your favorite beverage ready, and let's get this multimedia extravaganza started. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines and welcome to the SCCA 2023 Hall of Fame's Award Show. Let's roll. Costa and Wilma Dunias have been active members of the Sports Car Club of America since 1967, both as participants and leaders. This dynamic duo moved from their Texas home to Colorado when Costa took the position of Senior Vice President at the SCCA, where he oversaw various programs and departments. It was in this role that Costa became a face for SCCA across the country, willing to help with any problem. Costa was instrumental in establishing the Race Steward Training Program for new participants. He helped write the Executive Stewards Manual and advised on the Stewards and Training Manual. He was directly responsible for the establishment of Sports Reno, which carries on to this day in the form of the third generation of Spec Racer Ford. At the runoffs, Costa has been a driver, a race director, assistant race director, and SOM chair, just to name a few. He was the first Hoosier Super Tour race director and has been the chair of the National Stewards Program. Wilma has served in a variety of road racing roles, including a very challenging stint serving as gatekeeper for drivers who wish to meet with the race director at the runoffs. In that role, she served as a good listener, a calming influence, and an information gatherer prior to the meeting. Though many may know the Dunias duo was road racers, the pair were the event chairs for the 1977 Solo National Championships, with Wilma holding that position again in 1979. Over the years, Costa, with Wilma by his side, has been awarded the Wolf Barnato Award, the David Morell Award, and the John McGill Award. Most importantly, though, both have been advocates for the SCCA through their words, their actions, and their willingness to help members and outsiders alike. Without further ado, please welcome Costa and Wilma Dunias to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Greetings. First of all, I'd like to thank SCCA and the Hall of Fame committees who did the work to make us inductees to the 2023 Hall of Fame. I'd like to honor and thank the current excellent staff that we have at SCCA. Also congratulate Rocky, Mary, and Bill. Uh, Kent, Bill Scott, and Jeff Shepherds. We've known Rocky and Kent and Mary for many years. We also knew Bill Scott, did not know Jim Jeffords. Our odyssey at SCCA began in early 1966 when we had a reasonably new Corvette that we had bought and we went to an event on a parking lot uh, just as we were driving around and stopped to see what was going on. Uh, this young man came up and started a conversation with us to uh, tell us about what was going on and explained that he had a Mustang GT350. His name was Dan Sherrod. He spent a lot of time talking about the event and then essentially asked if we were going to run the event and I said no, we didn't want to hurt our car. Well, the conversation evolved and he called me chicken. And that was probably the wrong thing to do. So I entered the event and turned out I beat him. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, we were friends for 56 years, uh, both personally and in the club. Uh, God rest his soul, he passed away early this year. Uh, people that had an impact as stewards on our, our journey Bob Gellis, James Royal, John Martinson, Johnny McGee, and Sue Rothell. These people showed us how people interact as stewards with the membership and, and did it in such a professional manner that it was very impressive. I'd like to mention also our David Jones. Uh, he was our friend and mentor when we were in the region and also when we went to Denver to work for SCCA. 
1983, we were between presidents and I was a senior staff member. And we went to the Detroit Grand Prix. And while I was there, I was invited to a press conference where a big announcement was gonna be made. And of course, I was curious, so I went. Turns out the announcement was that they were forming a, a, a organization called Renault Jeep Sport and Roy Lund was to be the president of that. They introduced Roy and he gave a talk about what they were gonna do in their, their mission statement. His mission statement coincidentally coincided with a project that we'd been working on at SCCA and trying to bring to fruition and had not been able to do it because we couldn't find anyone willing to participate. So after the uh, conference, I went to Roy and asked if uh, he had time for me to propose something to him and told him kind of what I was looking at. He <coughs> said he would love to do that. We arranged a meeting later that day. And I went and got R. David, who was the chairman of the board at that time. And we went to the meeting and explained to Roy what we were looking to do. And Roy told us what he thought he could do. And we shook hands. And a month later, we had drawings for the car. Later that year at the championships, we had the, a show car. We introduced the car to the membership. We took deposits for 125 cars that day, that weekend. Um, so it was a good time. I'd like to also mention Bill Johnson, who gave me a lot of responsibilities when I was on the board. And uh, he always was there to help and mentor me. Thank Terry Osmond, who early on in uh, SCCA history, she uh, put on a convention for us in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and also helped us transition the conventions from the members from the regions to the national office. Uh, Jim Creighton, who I worked with a lot at the runoffs and also uh, other projects in SCCA, uh, always uh, respected the fact that he kept me honest by always telling me not to get too big for my britches. Uh, important team members that I had, Doug Reed, Bill King, Dick Bonheim, Sharon Smith. These people were all outstanding staff members. Uh, Doug and Bill both uh, very active in helping promote and uh, put together a demonstration race for the sports Renaults in 1984 at the Ronalds. We had 54 cars start. Uh, and that indicated to the board that maybe it should be a national class and they made it a national class for 1985. Um, Bill and Doug also uh, helped a lot when we established the Club Racing Endurance Series, which later became the Playboy Series. Uh, Dick Bonheim was a rally salary manager. He, was, uh, he had a pretty strong marketing bent and during his tenure at SCCA working with us, he worked with Mark Gerstein and Art Trier, Giants of the Solo Community to make Solo a profitable uh, venture for the club. I've had the honor of receiving the John McGill Award, the Dave Morrell Award, and the Wolf Leonardo Award, and for those, I'm grateful. Uh, and finally, none of this would be possible without this person sitting next to me, Wilma Dunius. Throughout our marriage, she has supported every wild hair I've had. She's always um, supported any move I would need to make. And when I was offered the position at SCCA, her response was, how often does an opportunity such as this come along? Let's do it. Right? So it's my turn. <laughs> Many of our friends have asked, how in the world did you ever get involved in sports car racing? Well, it's an easy answer. We bought a Corvette. And Costa, being the proud owner that he was, had to brag to our best man of, the new, of his new acquisition. And the best man replied, well, I'll go you one better. I've just bought a Lotus Elan. He lived in the Dallas area and we in Lubbock. So he proposed that we meet him at Green Valley Raceway at Smithfield, Texas for a weekend of watching races. There we sat, turn five, just before the bridge, drinking Schlitz malt liquor, watching car after car after car go by. At the end of the weekend, Costa looked at me and he said, I think I'd like to do that. I remember looking up in the paddock area at the piles of tires, empty oil cans, and dirty little kids running around having the time of their little lives and thinking, oh my gosh, is this the way that we're going to raise our family? 
We returned home, and in no time, Costa found a Triumph Spitfire that an airman from the local base had brought home from England when he returned home at the end of his deployment. Costa had a job where he had to finish, he had to furnish his own car, and he pleaded a case for the economy of the Triumph, getting good gas mileage in order to use it in his business. Well, in no time, there was a piece of metal that was being bent around a tree in the driveway to make a scatter shield for the transmission. And the Spitfire, oddly enough, sprouted at a roll bar. I was dipping long-handled underwear in borax to make it fireproof, and Dymo, label, Dymo, Dymo tape labeling all the pertinent information in the back of the helmet that suddenly appeared on the dining room table. We borrowed a flatbed trailer from my uncle who used it in his car business and Costa successfully conned a friend who had a Mustang that had a trailer hitch on it into towing us to the Texas Region Driver's School. Costa went to the classroom part of the school on Friday night and Saturday morning dawn bright and clear. We were scurrying around getting numbers on the car, going through tech inspection and working to get him all ready for his on-track driving experience. He picked up his helmet, turned to me, looked me straight in the eye, and said, I don't want to do this. I was dumbfounded. I said, what? He repeated that. I don't want to do this. I put on my meanest, ticked off, wifely frown and said, you get that helmet on, get in that car, buckle yourself in, and get on the track. We'll talk about this tonight. You know what? We have never had that talk. We couldn't get that man out of that car and then and never have since. What did happen that weekend was that it served to open the doors to literally hundreds and maybe even thousands of wonderful people like yourselves, who like us literally spent every penny, nickel and dime available in order to run Mach 5 with our hair on fire down the pavement and dirty, dirty roads, doing our best to make the car go fastest, faster than stink in order to help make the driver the first across the finish line. We knew a lot of you before you married and now your grandkids are racing and having fun with cars. Our greatest privilege is now to be field staff to help make that fun with cars happen with the greatest perfection that we can offer. The bonds and friendships that we have made over the years have been inseparable, not only with drivers, their families and crews, but with those working to set up solo courses, shagging pylons, engineering and laying out and working checkpoints at rally events, working corners, tech inspection, pace car timing and scoring, registration, competitor services center, welcome team, grid, ES, security, and the list goes on and on and on. All of you are people who we would do any and everything for because you are one of our own. What an humbling honor to be named the 2023 class SECA's Hall of Fame member. What a whopper of a ride it's been, and we guarantee, we guarantee that we'll do all that we can to do, be good examples and representatives of this honor. Thank you ever so much from the bottom of two very grateful hearts. Thank you. Robert Rocky Entrican Jr. has been a force of nature for the SCCA since the early 1970s. Rocky's SCCA career actually began before he was officially a member. He was made an honorary member of the Kansas region in 1969 and officially joined the club two years later. He immediately became involved in his region's planning, eventually serving as the regional executive in 1974. Rocky was assigned to cover the inaugural Solo National Championships in 1973 for Sports Car Magazine. He has competed in 100% of the Solo National Championships and covered all but one year, 1975, for Sports Car Magazine. That year, he just happened to be a bit busy being the event chair for the Solo Nationals. As the event has grown, so have his duties, which now include a team of more than two dozen writers each year. His solo stats book, compiled annually, features the driving record of every driver who has ever participated at Solo Nationals and is considered the Bible of Solo National statistics. In 1976, Rocky became a member of the Wichita region and was one of the founding members of the Salina region in 1990. Behind the wheel, Rocky continues to compete in the 1964 Triumph Spitfire that he purchased from an SCCA member in 1966. In his career, he has won the Solo Cup, the Verne Jacques Award for contributions to Sports Car Magazine, a Solo One National Championship, and multiple Midwest Division Solo titles. 
In 2016, Rocky was honored with the Dick Berger Perseverance Award, presented in his case for his continued support of the Solo National Championships. He was also the first recipient of the Dave and Joe Richards Award, established in 2019 as Salina Region's highest honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Rocky Entrigan Jr. to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Good evening. I'm coming to you from the garage, a brand new automotive museum that opened in Salina last February. The current exhibit is race cars. Over there is an Al Unser IndyCar. That way is Ernie Irvin's Daytona 500 winner. There's everything here from Bonneville Speed Record cards to dirt track cars to soapbox derby racers and a couple of SCCA cars, including the Triumph Spitfire I've owned and autocross since 1965, and which my brother Bucko converted into a race car in 1971. I hope Buck is watching because I have a message. Buck, this is all your fault. <laughs> in 1965, while I was in college at the University of Kansas, I had the opportunity to spend a summer in Europe. <coughs> Students from all over assembled in Washington, D.C. for an orientation and a charter flight to Brussels. For whatever reason, 10 weeks later, the return charter flew back not to D.C., but to New York City, where Buck lived at the time. I had two weeks before I had to be back at KU, so I crashed with my brother. We're going to an autocross Sunday. Good. What's that? So we went to the autocross, where Buck ran his MGA and another the next Sunday. And then his club, Team X, was doing one the Sunday before he had to leave. I worked up the courage to ask if I could try it. Okay, but you won't beat anybody. Well, I did beat somebody. Class F had 21 cars. I finished 11th. Buck finished 5th. I came home to Lawrence and soon bought the Spitfire. Now, I am very aware that while the role of the SCCA Hall of Fame includes many immortal drivers, my inclusion in this August group has almost nothing to do with my talent behind the wheel. Probably mostly my prowess behind the keyboard. I came to work for the Salina Journal in 1969. After a few months, sports editor Bill Burke allowed me to begin writing a motorsports column. And so for 13 years, Rocky's Road was a regular feature in the Salina Journal. In time, my reach expanded to following more than five dozen auto racing series in the U.S. and worldwide. I keep current with that many series by keeping my own point scores. Today I have file cabinets and banker boxes filled with points tallies and race results reaching back to the early 1970s. It's also how I became the Midwest Division points keeper for its regional race series in 1973. I need a shout out here to Charlie Clark when he was Area 6 Director. He appointed me twice to be the mid -Div National Points Keeper as well. Today the position has me keeping score for our Divisional Road Racing Championship, Time Trial Series, and Solo Series. For me, this is part of my fun with cars. In 1972, I worked timing at the Lake Afton Grand Prix, an SCCA club race in a city park west of Wichita. I decided to write a story about it and sent it on spec to sports car just to see what might happen. Well, they ran the story. And in 1973's SCCA convention, sports car gave me its best story award. That began a 50 year relationship. A few months later, Sports Cars editor, Dan Brown, called and said SCCA was going to have this new Solo 2 championship in Wentzville, Missouri, and would I cover it for them? Well, sure. The next year they called again, and that's when I realized there was no such thing as a press guide for the event. If I wanted one, I'd have to make my own. 
So I began keeping records. Eventually, people learned I had these records and asked if they could get a copy. Not a lot, but a few. And that was the beginning of what became my solo stats record book. So now, except for 1975, when I was the event chair, I have covered every one of the solo naturals for sports car. At first, it was just a one-man show and four or five pages in the magazine. Then a small group of three or four writers. But the members wanted more. Something like the treatment the runoffs got, a separate story for every class. So today, I chief a crew of about two dozen writers and edit all their stories to bring SCCA members and event report exceeding 50 pages. When I retired from the Slanted Journal in 1969, 1995, I called Rich McCormick, then the editor of Sports Car, to see if he could use me for some freelance work. For 16 years, I wrote a monthly feature, Sports Car Spotlight, later called Pace Setters, that called upon my experience as a general news reporter and editor. The subject was SCCA members that were, who were leaders outside the club. I was able to interview a fascinating array of subjects, rocket scientists and racers and actors, entrepreneurs, Olympic athletes, and a few famous racers. I've been privileged to write for editors Brown and McCormack, Richard James, and Philip Royal, to whom I owe thanks for decades of friendship and support. In 1981, I received the Solo Cup, an award only four years old. So new the plaque they gave me doesn't even have its title right. It just says it's this generic Solo Award, <laughs> but it hangs proudly in my family room. At the time, though, I wondered why me? But it must have been hard put, I thought, for the Solo Award to find the total recipient. The next year, nobody got it. But then, since then, it has saluted a parade of leaders in the sport, and I have strived to be deserving of that honor. It is quite a privilege today to join the Hall of Fame the same time as some longtime friends, Kent and Kathy Prather, Costa and Bowman Dunius. In my SECA life, I road raced as budget permitted, but almost could afford the autocross. My last racing season in 2011, both Kent and Costa played a significant part. It was Kent who commanded me to take my car to a prep shop after he and his crew figured out why I wouldn't start at my first race. He was not available, so I found one just as good, his son Jesse. I did five races to get the points to qualify, and after every race, there was some issue to fix. By the time I had got to the runoffs, Jesse had worked his way through my car from front to rear. The result was, I had a trouble-free runoffs week at Road America. It was Costa who was chief steward at Pikes Peak when I missed Sunday qualifying and had to beg permission to race. Of course, he had to bust my chops first. It was Kent again at Road America, having just won his seventh national championship the day before. Waiting at the grid Sunday, to cheer on some nebbish who had qualified dead last. It was Kent who sent me back to my paddock to get rain tires. Then he came and did the tire change for me as I buckled back into the car. I made it back to grid just as it was leaving for the pace lap. I had to do a runoff just once. The experience was beyond expectations. Started 20th, finished 11th, Rain tires was the right call. It's been a great ride, and I'm not done yet. I've been president of two independent sports car clubs and RE of two SECA regions. I've had the friendship and support of countless leaders in the Kansas, Wichita, and Salina regions and throughout the Midwest Division and SECA nationwide. 
Sometimes I wonder what my life would have been had that charter returned to D.C. instead of New York. If Buck hadn't let me drive that first autocross. If I hadn't changed my major to journalism. What if Buck hadn't moved to Lawrence and built my, car, my Spitfire into a race car? What if my wonderful wife Sandy hadn't supported my passion? We'll be married 34 years in March and I believe we've made each other's dreams happen. Sandy has certainly made mine happen. Someone once asked, why do you race? I answered that as a youngster, I never considered myself particularly athletic. When I was introduced to motorsport, I realized that on some level, this is something I could do reasonably well and have fun doing it. And then I soon learned what an incredible community autocross and racing and SECA is. That's become the greatest reason and why I'm still involved almost 60 years later. Thank you and good night. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. It's been a tiger all year. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Jim Jeffords' racing career may not have been the longest, but it was almost certainly unmatched. The Milwaukee area racer began his career in Jaguars, where he reportedly won 14 of his first 17 races. His run in the 1956 June sprints got the attention of General Motors' Ed Cole, who told him after the race, quote, that's the last time you drive against us, unquote. That started the era of Jeffords' Purple People Eater Corvette, the 1958 and 59 B Production National Championship winning car made famous by both its color and Jeffords' success behind the wheel. In 1958, Jeffords also drove Harley Earl's SR2 and SCCA events and at the 12 Hours of Sebring, and then a Purple Scarab in 1959. The Purple People Eater also won races in Nassau, with Jeffords becoming the first American driver in an American car to accomplish that feat. Jeffords' accomplishments are all the more impressive when considering the drivers he competed against. Dan Gurney, Sterling Moss, Carroll Shelby, Jim Hall, Bob Bondurant, Roger Penske, Ken Miles, and more were all at the top of their game when Jeffords beat them on the track. An unfortunate illness and long hospitalization led to Jeffords' premature retirement as a driver in 1960 after just five seasons. That didn't end his motorsports career, however. Jeffords helped start the AMC Javelin racing team that ran an SCCA Trans Am competition and managed the team in 1968 with drivers George Fulmer, Peter Revson, Jerry Grant, and John Martin. His advertising business produced and published the Road America event posters and programs from the 1950s through the 1970s, which are now collectibles. And Jefford served on Road America's board of directors and as the track's vice president until his passing in 2014. He is a member of the Corvette Hall of Fame, the Legends of Riverside, and the Road Racing Drivers Club, and has earned Road America's Governor's Cup. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim Jeffords to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Hi, um, I wanted to say a few words about my father, Jim Jeffords, on his induction to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Uh, I know he'd be very, very proud of uh, that. Um, he joined the SCCA in 1954, uh, and he started racing cars, uh, Jaguar XK120 and a 140, and... Um, he did quite well with them. Uh, he won 14 of his first 17 races with uh, the Jaguars. And um, he had uh, talked to General Motors about joining their Corvette racing team, which he heard was coming out. Uh, he was supposed to have a Corvette for the 1956 uh, June sprints at Road America, uh, but a car wasn't ready for him. So he uh, entered his XK140 and did quite well. He was past four Corvettes and was leading the race. Uh, with about half lap to go, and he uh, lost a freeze plug on an overshift, uh, over over rev on a downshift, going to turn 12. So, but Ed Cole told him, he goes, "Well, that's the last time you race against us, because for an XK140 to pass four Corvettes was pretty amazing, especially at Road America." Like I said, he won 14 of the first 17 races he entered. 
Uh, he then raced for Corvette, was pretty successful, but then they had a factory ban uh, on racing, the big three. So then he, uh, but in 58 and 59, he raced a, a Corvette with, sponsored by Nikki Chevrolet out of Chicago. Uh, it's called the Purple People Eater, a quite famous car. And he, with that, and he also raced a Scarab. And he won uh, 27 of the 41 races in 1958 and 59. He was the SCCA B Production National Champion in 1958 and 1959. Uh, and he was the first national champion from the Milwaukee region. About this time, he was also the first editor of the Milwaukee region newsletter called The Drift. He called it The Drifter. It was called The Drifter. And then it became The Drift and had several editors after that, like Pierre Pierre and Bob Birmingham, but he was the first um, editor of that magazine. Um, he raced, uh, like I say, was the B Production National Champion. He also raced the Scarab. He raced at uh, Watkins Glen, Virginia International Raceway, Marlboro, Riverside, Road America, Meadowdale. He won at all those tracks. Uh, he also set several track records, which lasted for years. Uh, he was the first uh, winner of the in the 1960 a first professional road race at Road America for sports cars, uh, driving a Maserati. Um, he beat some very good drivers in that in those days, uh, like Roger Ward, Lloyd Ruby, Carroll Shelby, Dan Gurney, Sterling Moss, Augie Pabst. Uh, the list goes on and on. But he beat uh, all these drivers and was very competitive with them, although he mostly raced as an amateur. So his driving ability alone, what I think, would have got him into the SECA. Uh, Hall of Fame, but he was also on the board of directors at Road America from 1958 to 19 to 2014, um, 56 years. Uh, he rose to be vice president, was instrumental in the track, uh, you know, expanding and getting bigger and bigger and better and better. Uh, for so 56 years as vice president of Road America, uh, he also did all the programs for Road America and all the posters for Road America. Uh, my brothers and I helped put some of those posters up around the town. Uh, but he designed all those uh, posters and uh, put, put those up. Uh, he also did um, the Road America logo. It says RA and then Road America underneath. Um, he designed that. And uh, that's quite instrumental because they're still using it today. He designed it back around the 25th anniversary of Road America. They're now on their 68th uh, anniversary. Um, and he designed that program. Uh, he's along of the way he also won, was elected to the Corvette Hall of Fame in 2002. Uh, he was uh, won the Road America Governor's Cup. And he also won the Cliff Tufty Road Award for contributions to road racing. He was very proud of those awards. But I think his induction in the SCCA Hall of Fame, um, he'd be very, very proud of that. If you see some of his pictures, he used to wear a baseball cap. It had the SCCA logo on it, Sports Car Club of America, and he was very proud of that. So I think with that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, his election of the SCCA Hall of Fame, and I thank you very much. Kent and Kathy Prather epitomized the perfect racing partnership. While Kent was the face of Prather Racing, the business and at-track events would not have achieved the level of success it saw without Kathy's crucial involvement. Prather Racing grew to become the premier car and engine builders for multiple makes and manufacturers, but is closely aligned with British racing cars. On the track, Kent's British racing engines were only rivaled by Huffaker Racing, led by fellow SCCA Hall of Famers Joe Huffaker Sr. and Joe Huffaker Jr. Kent's record as a car builder and driver is in SCCA's top 1%. His eight runoff wins is seventh on the all-time list, with six of those coming in his iconic MGA and G production, and two later in his career at Road America in a GT Lite Mazda Miata. The first of those national championships came in 1986, the most recent in 2012. Kent competed in an impressive 32 consecutive runoffs and scored 15 runoffs podium finishes during his career. Those national championships were paired with two significant awards, the first being the Kimberly Cup in 1986 for the most outstanding driver in SCCA club racing competition, and then in 2005 when he was presented with the President's Cup for ability, competitiveness, and success at the runoffs. 
not just of a Hall of Famer on the track, Kent's involvement in leadership and support roles with Kansas Region and the Caw Valley Race Group spans three decades. While Kent was responsible for the on-track activities, Kathy was busy organizing paddock events and providing hospitality to the team, clients, and friends. It was sometimes said that during race weekends, every British roadster within a 100-mile radius could be found near the Prather Racing Paddock. Aside from specialized knowledge, resources, and meals for fellow British car enthusiasts, that same hospitality and camaraderie were also open to competitors. For Kent and Kathy knew that the racing community is only what it is because of that openness to share and teach, spreading the gospel of the SCCA to whoever will listen. Kent and Kathy still give back to SCCA locally and at the runoff. Kathy works registration, and Kent is pace car chief for the runoffs, an event neither intend to miss. And to this day, the Prather Racing Shop remains open once a week in Topeka, Kansas, where racers of all types and abilities routinely stop by for encouragement, fellowship, and beverages. Please join me in welcoming Kent and Kathy Prather to the SCCA Hall of Fame. First of all, I'd just like to say what an honor it is to become a member of the SCCA Hall of Fame. There's no question there's a lot of famous people in there. Um, we put in our dues, but not like a whole lot of people have. I mean, Costa and Wilma, to be with them, I mean, they've been my heroes forever. So it's just really a really good thing. But, you know, sports car racing and sports car stuff is something that's been something that we've always done. We were fans of racing well before I bought my race car and started racing. We used to, we used to chase the K&M series around in Watkins Glen, Charlotte, that kind of stuff. You know, and the reason was because friends wanted to go with us. We were always able to have somebody and the neighborhood or whatever go to races with us. It's always been that type of an experience with family and kids. I just want to say what an honor. I really, really can't hardly believe this is happening. Um, I'd like to share a couple stories. In 1974, we moved to Virginia from Kansas. Uh, in the spring, about a month after we'd been there, some friends said, you guys need to go with us to the races at Summit Point, West Virginia. I'm like, okay, where do we stay? What do we do? Oh, we have a pup tent you can borrow. Oh yeah, a pup tent sounds fun. We get there, there's about five or six other couples who are all still friends. Some still go to the races. Um, we're in the circle in the east trees near the carousel, for those of you that know Summit Point. Have a campfire that night, get up the next morning. Summit Point's motto was rain or shine, starts at nine. We get up, we start watching races. I'm a Kansas farm girl. All I see is here is go straight or in circles. These guys are going right and left. There's big American cars. There's these little foreign things. I don't know, we have an MGA. That's all I know about. We're watching people. I'm sure it was Colonel Joe Hauser, Jim Miller, Randy Canfield, Ray Stone, John Kelly, Christine Fox, who all became friends of ours later on. And um, so that was Saturday. That evening it started raining. I'm in a pup tent. I think I slept with my clothes on top of me that night got up the next morning, our campfire is a big mud puddle. But the sun was shining, we watched more races, and I like to say, I'm still here going to SCCA races. My um, second story is about, oh, maybe 20 years later. We're at the runoffs at Mid-Ohio, on the golf cart with another woman, and she says to me, how can you stand to keep doing this all the time? At the time, I said, well, I just do what I got to do. What else am I going to do? Later on, I thought, what I should have said was, think of what I would have missed. Think of what I would have missed. Think of the friends that I made. Sorry, I'm a teary person. Think of the friends that I have from coast to coast all over this country. Thank you so much. I never expected this honor for me, but for him, definitely. Thank you. Being such a family affair, I got to tell you a couple of stories about the kids. You know, my son Jesse and my other son Todd always went to the track with us. Um, When they were really little, we used to take the vent out of the camper and put them up on top and 
rock, put them in a rocking chair and rock them to the, so they could take their naps so we wouldn't miss any racing. The, you know, when they got old enough, we always took their bicycles with us to the track. I mean, they both got their bicycle merit badges at the track, you know, from Boy Scouts. And, you know, and then Kirk and Peggy from Virginia and Judy and Greg from Virginia and uh, all these other people always came to the track with us. But it, when it came down to it, it was me, Kathy, Jesse, and Todd. You know, and we did our thing and we made sure that it was a family affair and they played with other kids and now they've both grown up and they have kids of their own and Jesse's a national champion also and Todd really likes cars and he's involved with us. So the whole thing has just been an unbelievable experience through family. It's just been the greatest. I have a couple stories when they were little guys. I think it was maybe Kent's first race at Summit Point. We were by ourselves. They were like two and four, maybe not even four yet for Jesse. Went up to the grid. I put their fingers in the chain link fence. I said, don't move. And they didn't. They stayed there for the whole thing. And then uh, maybe a couple months later, we had some friends there. We were parked in the back row of the paddock at Summit Point. And I lost Todd. And he's maybe two and a half. Couldn't find him anywhere. Walked around, walked around, walked around. Here comes the grid worker holding his hand. He was in the, in the, on the grid. He wanted to see the big boys. So that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, of course I gave him a big hug and a lecture, but our kids have gone to the track with us every year. It's been great, great. And I hope uh, more families bring their kids and their wives to the track think what they'll miss. <laughs> so I guess you need to know a little bit about the racing. So I bought the race car in 1979 and started working on it and found out from people like Sue Rothell that things are supposed to be legal, don't be doing anything wrong or cheating, that kind of stuff. The rest of the racer group all told me, well, by the way, an MGA is never going to win a national championship. Go out and have some fun, but don't, don't make your expectation high. You got to have a Sprite or a midget or an MGB or a Formula Ford if you want to win the national championship. So I started developing and I started doing things and I, you know, SCCA, yes, it's about friends, but it's also about the people that you have with you to have the same desire that you have to make your car go faster and make you drive better. Um, driving wasn't a problem. You just followed around with Colonel Joe. You'd see him for half a lap and he'd be gone. but. You did have Randy Canfield and Ray Stone and all those guys to, Jim, you know, Jim Miller, all those guys that you could see what was going on. But, but I had some help. Um, Wally Hicks decided that he was going to help me, so he did. And there are so many things Wally Hicks did to improve and make more compression. Then he even rented rented us one time his flow bench so that we could learn about valve back cuts and flowing and that kind of stuff. And my best friend, Steve Ellis, was also my chief mechanic at our shop in Virginia. And he was really talented in flow bench work. And just really without him, I'm sure there's no way I would have even won my first national championship. But the thing about it is, is that you just have to go for what you can do and go as fast as you can. We stayed in regional racing for four years until Kathy finally said, you know, it's time for you to move on. I think I won 13 of 15 races that year and it was time to move to national racing. So we got in national racing and that year I got a third place and a fourth place. So from 13 wins to a third and a fourth. So that was pretty good. We did go to the runoffs that year. During that season, we also had a rain race and I'm passing guys and I'm going, who's this guy? I've never raced with him before. Who's this guy? I've never raced with him because I was always mid to backpack. And, but in the rain though, I finally broke into the lead. Now I'm sure I didn't win. I'm sure Colonel Joe Hauser won that race, but it was still good. So, you know, you talk about, you know, development. So then I met a guy named John Kelly and Dick Knobloch. Those two guys had Elva Couriers. So they needed engine help. I helped them, they helped me, and on the way, we developed. We also bought a dyno together as a team, and then you really learn things on a dyno, and your, your motors are ready to go when you get to the track. So that's just been an unbelievable path for me to develop and to get better and better and never, never say this is enough. Each year, you can get another 
tenth of a second or a half a second or a second or whatever it is to go that much faster. Just never give up. So then you get to the point where all of a sudden people are helping you with tires. Goodyear was helping me. Hoosier Tire helps me to this day. You know, you get people like Mike Pushkar with Carbotech. You know, it just it's just amazing. Redline Oil helped us in the beginning. Now we're using Torco Oil. And it's just, you can't, you can't do this kind of level of racing without your sponsors. And so I thank all of them. They helped me get into the Hall of Fame. The, the whole thing is you go to the races with your friends, you enjoy the weekend, you come home, you work on your car, you go back again, you know, but, and even when I retired, finally after Daytona in 2014, or I guess it was 2015, we decided, okay, let's go vintage racing. So we've been doing that in the same car and we haven't missed racing. I've been racing for 42 years. It's just been a, a great experience and we don't anticipate quitting. So that's why we said, well, let's do some SCCA um, volunteering. So Kathy volunteers in registration. I volunteered for Pace Car. Um, I've been in my doing help in my region, KVRG in Kansas region for 30 years. It's just something that I don't know how I would exist without it. And I wouldn't exist without all of you out there and all my friends from the DC region and the Kansas region and all across the country that have made this all possible. Thank you. Bill Scott's racing career began with an SCCA school in 1964, where his instructor was none other than fellow SCCA Hall of Famer, Mark Donahue. That early instruction clearly took, as Bill went on to compete in more than 120 races nationally and internationally. He was the Formula V SCCA runoffs champion and the European Championship Formula V winner in 1968, and the U.S. Professional Super V champion in 1971 and 72. In 1969, he formed Bill Scott Racing, in which his primary role was driver coaching, and a number of his clients went on to win national championships. In the 1970s, he started a competition driving school at Summit Point Raceway, later adding anti-kidnapping and counter-terrorism training for chauffeurs. Perhaps most importantly, though, he created an accident avoidance school for young drivers. He showed a 30 to 40 percent reduction in accidents among teens who took his course. This model of coaching continues today, and his teen driving program was a model for programs like Tire Rack Street Survival. Bill's longest lasting showcase, though, was his care and service of Summit Point Raceway. The track had been a financial failure through its multiple ownerships, but in 1979, Bill and partner Tom Milner purchased the track. Bill demonstrated that by utilizing the track seven days a week, it could become a financial success. And it's a business model since used by many other tracks. During his ownership, he also expanded Summit Point from a one-circuit, 300-acre facility to its current four-circuit, 800-acre complex. His relationship with Washington, D.C. region was equally strong. He was a longtime member and served for two years on its board. The prevalent sentiment is that without Bill Scott, there would be no Summit Point, and there would therefore be a very different look to the Washington, D.C. region. Shortly before his passing in 2009, he decided against pursuing an opportunity to sell Summit Point to the government, wanting to honor his promise that the track would always be available for club racing. And as we know, it still is. For his work as both a driver and a true steward of the sport, please join me in welcoming Bill Scott to the SCCA Hall of Fame. Bill Scott loved racing. It was such a passion that much to his mother's chagrin, after he received his PhD from Yale in geophysics, he decided to go racing. He said when it came down to a choice between rocks and racing, he would choose racing any day. Bill went on to have a successful career in both Formula V and Formula Ford, with several national and world championships to his name. But after a horrific accident in, at the Nürburgring in Germany that resulted in numerous broken bones and a crushed hip, he knew he could no longer be competitive in pro racing. And competitive he was, first in racing and then in business and in life. Since he couldn't race, he turned his attention 
to keeping the sport of road racing viable in the mid-Atlantic region. During the energy crisis of late 70s with his long gas lines, Bill with his partner, Tom Milner, had the daring and some might say stupidity to invest in the future by purchasing the ailing Summit Point Speedway in West Virginia. His competitive spirit surfaced anew and he and Tom worked tirelessly to make the venture a success. It was Bill's realization that the business wouldn't survive with racing alone. So he reinvented himself by offering schools, not only for the obvious racing, but also for driver safety. These classes fortuitously morphed into counterterrorism schools for the government. And it was the revenue from these government contracts that made it possible for road racing to survive at Summit Point. But of all the programs offered at Summit Point, I think he was most proud of his accident avoidance schools geared primarily for teenage drivers. He often said, these schools save lives. And he was right. In a study conducted over several years, the students who took the course had fewer and less severe accidents than their peers in the control group. Bill was the, the visionary in our family. It was his idea to partner with Brian Redman to launch the Jefferson 500 Vintage Race Weekend, a wonderful success for many years. And it was Bill's plan to expand racing by designing and building more road racing tracks on our excess land. For the design of the Shenandoah circuit at the now Summit Point Motorsports Park, Bill and I traveled to Germany rented the Nürburgring for the morning, and then measured and charted the path and altitude changes of the famous carousel turn. A reasonable facsimile is in place on the Shenandoah circuit today. Life was never dull being married to Bill Scott. As a family man, he planned outings and gatherings that were far from the ordinary. He, we went on fossil finding trips in Pennsylvania and visited his geological research sites in Venezuela and Norway. Closer to home, he organized road rallies with bizarre themes for friends and family. He made wine, tended his beehives, was an excellent orchardist, and on top of all that, he was there for our four children, be it soccer games, wrestling matches, a play, or an art exhibit. Yes, Bill had a passion for racing, but also an amazing passion for all aspects of life. If he were here today, he would be very honored to be inducted into the SCCA Hall of Fame. From our entire family, thank you so much. The Member of Excellence Award is presented annually to the volunteer who shows the greatest commitment to serving and supporting SCCA motorsports activities, and the winner of this prestigious award is given the opportunity to attend any motorsport event of their choosing across the globe with an expense cap of up to $5,000. With this, I'd like to share some background on this year's SCCA Member of Excellence, so let's get rolling. This member joined the SCCA in the Central Florida region in 1993 and has had a tremendous service leadership and participation history with the club, both regionally and nationally. He's been a member and a competitor in Spec Racer, Spec Racer Ford, and Spec Racer Ford Gen 3 for more than two decades. He was a Central Florida Region Assistant RE, the region's webmaster, and he also holds a full comp license, an advanced time trials, and a divisional FNC license as well, and has worked pretty much across all specialties on race weekends, FNC, grid, pit, race admin, and served as a regional steward as well. He's also a track event and time trials safety steward, a track event and time trials driver's coach, and a track event time trials event lead. In fact, on many nights, you can find him leading track night in America events across the Southeast. This individual has served the club at a national level as well, leading the club through some challenging times as a prominent leader on the SCCA board of directors, working to navigate president CEO transitions, significant business challenges across SCCA Inc, Pro and Enterprises, and under his leadership, these were all handled with a steady hand, 
fair dealing and with an eye towards doing what is best for the club overall versus what might benefit a specific interest group. If you haven't figured out this year's winner yet, here's a couple of comments from his peers as well as a few select quotes he used often. In terms of comments, our first one is, there are many people who eat, sleep, and race and work all things SCCA, and this individual is certainly one of those folks, but he also works hard so that others can enjoy everything that he's had the opportunity to enjoy, and he never forgets that we're all about people and having fun with cars. Second quote, in all of my business years with the SCCA, I've never known a person as smart as Mr. XXX, and I wish he was President of the United States. A couple of uh, familiar quotes. Uh, the first one, don't layered so-called technology solutions on top of tortured processes. And two of my favorites, uh, don't schnitzel this up, which happens to be closely related to, he almost cobbed it. To sum up this nomination, this member is a role model for the SECA. He's served the members and those that served the members since joining the club back in the early 90s. And on a personal note, he's been an incredible mentor, sounding board, supporter, and friend. He's also extended grace to me when I wrecked his car in the outlap at Daytona and when I blessed our Enduro team with a two-position penalty for passing under yellow at Sebring. And by the way, Leland, I really didn't see that flag. Ladies and gentlemen of the SCCA family, it's my honor to introduce you to your 2022 SCCA Member of Excellence, my former boss, your former chairman, and the current CEO of Team Giant Band-Aid Racing, Mr. Lee Hill of the Central Florida and North Carolina regions. Congratulations, Lee. Good evening, everybody. Uh, <laughs> this uh, it has been a real surprise when Mike, when Mike, called, uh, Mike Cobb called me the other day. Uh, to tell me that I had uh, been selected for the Member of Excellence Award for this year. Uh, my first reaction was to check my calendar and make sure it wasn't April Fool's Day. Uh, but when I realized it was still January, I figured he must be serious. Uh, <laughs> wow, I, I, I'm just com put completely uh, com completely floored to, to receive this award. I'm very much aware of the history of the award, the significance, um, the uh, the outstanding member that was behind the creation of this award, uh, as well as the members that have received this award in the past. And I know that uh, that's an a outstanding group of SCCA members. Uh, I'm honored to be joining them. Uh, you know, this is my 30th year in SCCA, and as a lifelong motorsports enthusiast and car guy, um, I, you know, the opportunities I've had and, and the experiences that I've had uh, in that time. I started racing spec racers in 1994 uh, in a sports Renault. And I still have and still race uh, a Gen 3 spec racer. Um, I've been able to compete at all levels of the club from regionals to the runoffs, from regional time trials to time trials nationals, from regional solo to the solo nationals in Lincoln. Uh, and you know, the people I have encountered along the way that I've worked with as a volunteer, uh, that I've competed with on the track, just been an outstanding group of people. And this has been just such an important part of my life. Um, it, it's I, it just, I'm, I'm pretty much without words, which for me is a fairly unusual um, occurrence. I, uh, my wife and I discussed very briefly what we would like to do with this award, and we uh, plan to try to make it to the British uh, GP at Silverstone this summer. Uh, very much looking forward to that. And um, on that, I guess I will say uh, good night. Thank you so much. I am absolutely honored uh, and deeply appreciative of this award. Good night, everyone. Good evening. The Wolf Bernardo Award is the club's highest honor. It is presented annually to a member who has made the most significant long-term contribution to the club. The award was created in 1948 and named for the legendary British racer who, among his other accomplishments, won the 24 Hours of Le Mans three times in a row, the only person to do so. His spirit of unbridled passion for sports cars and sports car racing is remembered with this award. 
As last year's recipient, it is my honor to introduce the 75th recipient of the Wolf Bernardo Award. Our winner tonight is well known to many of you, and that makes my job of introducing him without revealing his identity particularly challenging. I will share with you one innovation of our winner. He created the pylon rule for solo that stipulates that a penalty for knocking over a cone would only be assessed if the cone was knocked over or knocked out of a box painted on the pavement. This down or out rule originally created just for his own event was eventually adopted by the solo events board and effectively ended many arguments about penalties and brought needed consistency to the sport. Our winner has a long and distinguished resume in the club. During his 50 years as an SCCA member, he is a contributing editor to Sports Car Magazine, having won the Best Story Award six times. He started and still supervises the extensive coverage of the Solo Nationals in Sports Car Magazine. He led the effort to charter his home region and serve as its regional executive. He currently serves as divisional points keeper for racing, time trials, and solo. He created and maintains the Solo Nationals record book, an essential reference uh, for this event with data going back to 1973. He is one of only seven 100 percenters who, that have attended every Solo Nationals event. And as of tonight, he's a member of the SCCA Hall of Fame. It is my honor to introduce to you your Wolf Bernardo Award winner, Rocky Entrican of the Salina region. Congratulations, Rocky. Hello, me again. It is just overwhelming to realize that two different committees of award selectors gathered to choose recipients for two of SCCA's most prestigious awards, and both of them landed on me at the same time. From deep in my four-cylinder heart, thank you. It is an incredible and utterly unexpected honor. I'm a writer, so you'd think I could come up with some erudite phrase that would be quoted through the ages. But the best I seem able to do is steal quotes from other people. When I told my wonderful wife Sandy about the Barnado, her first thought was Sally Field winning her second Oscar. You really like me! <laughs> but my thought went more to Paul Newman when he won the first of his four runoff championships. Screw the Oscars. This is terrific. After SECA President Mike Cobb called to tell me I'd been named to the Hall of Fame, I had to make a video of a speech. I fussed over it for a month or so and then finally recorded it, which you saw earlier. Two days after I recorded it, Rich Beretta calls to tell me I'd won the Wolf Barnado. My first reaction, I sounded like John McEnroe, objecting to a line call. Are you serious? I looked through the list of 75 people who have won this before me. It is difficult to even imagine, much less accept, that somehow I'm on the same page with the likes of Briggs Cunningham. Curtis LeMay, Jim Kimberly. He made the cover of Sports Illustrated for his exploits as an SECA racer. Jack Hinkle. He was a key figure in that first story I wrote, Sports Car, which kind of began this incredible journey. Mark Donahue. I was in the audience at an SECA convention in San Francisco when he received his. Me, a member all of two years, staring up at this self-confident racing god. Eventually, I began to cross paths with later winners and came to call them friend. Among them, Roger Johnson, 
Bill Johnson, Mark Gerstein, Kathy Barnes, Howard Duncan, and very recent recipients, Karen Babb, course designer extraordinaire, Charlie Davis. I passed the Burger Award on to him as we shared the futility of returning to the solo nationals despite fading hopes of placing well. Dennis Dean, who was one of my earlier sports car spotlight subjects, having just retired as captain of a Navy cruiser. You need to understand, he was a Navy captain, top of the ship's chain of command. I was a second class petty officer, far down that chain. Today he's stewarding Formula One races. Last year, when Charlie Clark went into the Hall of Fame, he commented on how this club gives you awards for having fun. Most of what I've been able to do in SECA is I do just because it's fun. Midwest Division has let me be points keeper for 50 years. Now that's a job most anyone can do, and some have called it thankless, which for me, it certainly is not. But to me, it is great fun. I enjoy gathering and disseminating the data that enables drivers, both racers and autocrossers, and recently time trialers too, to realize their championship dreams. I have enjoyed chronicling those accomplishments in the pages of Sports Car and other publications. One way being a journalist has prepared me for today, I do know who Wolf Bonato was. Another favorite quote comes to mind that seems to echo how much I have enjoyed doing what I do. It is a gentle understatement from Formula One driver Clay Regazzoni, long a number two at Ferrari, who said, to win is nice, to race is enough. Finally, one more I came across the other day, and this one is mine. I wrote it years ago. SECA, and especially autocross, is my social circle. It is my comfort zone. For it's where I am a competent and competitive participant. It's where I can be leader or follower, as I choose. It is a great equalizer, where those I call friend include all spectra of society. The common, the weird the placid, the wacko, with one common attribute. They're all fun to be around. I fit in there somewhere. On behalf of the SECA Board of Directors, SECA staff, and SECA membership at large, I want to congratulate each of our award winners tonight. Hall of Fame inductees Costa and Wilma Dunias, Kent and Kathy Prather, Jim Jeffords and Bill Scott and their families, and Mr. Robert Rocky Intrican Jr., who was also this year's recipient of the Wolf Bernardo Award. I also want to congratulate our Member of Excellence winner, Mr. Lee Hill. These individuals have contributed greatly to the club, and we're absolutely blessed to have them as vital members of this family that we call the Sports Car Club of, of America. Early in the annual meeting and in the general session, we talked about the importance of engagement and how each of us as members play a role in creating an SCCA experience that invites and fosters that engagement. How we show up makes a difference. It either invites others in or it pushes them away. In the last two years that we've shown, even in the face of a global pandemic, supply chain shortages, and historic rates of inflation, by working together, we can make memorable experiences that last a lifetime. Experiences that create SCCA members across generations, and experiences that drive engagement. In that spirit, I want to thank tonight's award winners. Thank you for your many contributions, for the good seed you've sown in the SECA. Obviously, we stand on your shoulders tonight, and we're beyond grateful for your dedication. And to each and every one of you watching, thank you for your continued support of the club. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay engaged with the SECA. I look forward to making some memories with each of you at an SECA event in the very near future. That's a wrap for tonight. God bless and good night from Studio SCCA.